But what has been clear to me in the recent years is that we tend to be quite unprepared about what it means to litigate these matters in court. My first experience in being in court was when I went in an, as a witness for the SGR matter uh, with the National Environmental Tribunal. And I was fairly intimidated, uh, both in terms of the process and also in terms of the engagement of the, of the, of the team, the, the bench. Uh, partly because some matters that I thought were obvious were not necessarily obvious to them or known to them, but two, that one had to be so prepared to know not only how you lay out your facts, but also how you package strategically uh, anticipating different counter responses, um, uh, both from the branch and from the from the others on the floor. So what is evident is that many of us are not trained in, in being able to litigate uh, matters of environmental issues, and we don't all have to be the lawyers in the house, but we do need to know what the lawyers need so that our cases can succeed. We do need to know what makes for a good public litigation agenda and, and what we need to collate and collect as facts to support the teams we have engaged. So um, with us today is Liz Guitari, who also is our legal counsel for the one of the matters that is in court, the, the Kiliawo Agricultural uh, Development in Amboseli. And in engaging with her, we realize that a lot of our ignorance is no excuse. And if we can work with her to enlighten us, equip us, um, prepare us, then we would all be better uh, uh, equipped, uh, depending on what matters we ever need to end, that ever need to end up in court, to prepare better and to know what such outcomes can be and what that means, um, not only for us, but for the, for the decisions that are made by the tribunals. So we want to welcome you, Liz, and thank you so much for giving of your time. And I would encourage all of us to engage as much as we can. We'd be happy to have follow-on discussions after this if the time allocated today runs out. Uh, but we really look forward to this being an empowering session and an enlightening session uh, for us. Karibu sana. And over to you, Liz. Thank you very much, Lucy, for that kind introduction. Um, I wonder whether, Sheila, you might be able to present uh, my presentation? Or should I just go ahead and let's see whether I'm able to... And Liz, yeah. while you put your presentation up, forgive me, I think I needed to explain that you are a managing partner at Ogolo and that your speciality is, in, is an attorney in environment and natural resources. My apologies for not completing the introduction. Thank you. It's okay. Um, we, we are not very big on titles, so, but thank you for, for that introduction. Um, welcome uh, members of CAK and anyone else who might have joined the webinar, but they're not uh, members of CAK. Please see Sheila about joining uh, the Conservation Alliance. She will give you uh, the information you need on how to be a part of this incredibly critical uh, organization that's moving um, environmental governance forward in the country. So we will spend about uh, 40 to 45 minutes going through uh, what we have prepared as um, the presenters for today's webinar and then take about 30 minutes or 20 to 30 minutes for questions. Um, I would quite uh, encourage everybody for any question that you might have as we go along with the uh, presentation, if you're able to note it down somewhere or to probably put it into the uh, chat box, then we will be, uh, Sheila will be in a position to sort of uh, collate all of those questions and we can address them at the end of the presentation because you might find that a question you might have in slide three might be answered in slide six. And also so that you can have uh, a smooth sort of running of the webinar. I would like to outline the presentation today. We're going to have a short conversation or short introduction on who we are as Ogolo advocates. Um, then we're going to have a look at what is environmental uh, public interest litigation. 
uh, we're going to answer the question, why uh, is environmental public interest litigation or appeal going forward important for us as citizens of the country? We are also going to look at the how. How exactly do you go about litigating environmental matters in courts and in tribunals in Kenya? and what is needed for you as a participant in the process, as a, either as a plaintiff. Sometimes you might find uh, that in your position as probably a director in a private company, you might find yourself on the other end uh, of the spectrum as a defendant to public in, in, in a public interest uh, litigation case. And we're also going to sort of um, handle uh, that. Uh, we're going to look at some of the issues that Lucy has raised in terms of how do you conduct yourself in, uh, in trial proceedings, in a suit, in court, in a tribunal, how do you answer questions, uh, must you be very formal, are you allowed to wear jeans in court, must you come um, uh, to court in a suit, so on and so forth. Uh, we are then going to look at some of the examples of um, uh, appeal in the region and in Kenya as well. Uh, we're going to discuss how some of those uh, decisions impacted environmental governance in the country. Then we're going uh, to finally look at what can we do as citizens to engage in the process? Uh, what is the best way to support appeal cases as um, private citizens uh, and also as members of uh, non-governmental organizations or directors in those organizations. And after that, we're going to close up our presentation and field any questions um, that you might have. So who exactly is Ogolo? Uh, Ogolo stands for Odipo Gitari uh, Otoyo and Company Advocates. And we specialize in environmental sustainability uh, law. We have been in existence since 2014 and we were founded, uh, the law firm was founded by Miss Veronica Odipo, who unfortunately was not able uh, to join us today. She's still held up in court. Um, and the other two partners, that is myself, Elizabeth Kitari, and Yvonne Otoya, who is, who is on the call. And if you allow me, Sheila, I'm going to give her uh, just a couple of uh, minutes to take us through uh, what she does at the farm. So we, we at Ogolo essentially believe that law and policy can be used to build uh, an environmentally conscious society that promotes sustainability as well as secures community livelihoods. A lot of the time when you look at the history of environmental governance and law in Kenya, you might find that um, law and especially the judicial process has actually there's an impediment to realizing some of the rights that accrue to citizens in respect of um, uh, being you know in respect of uh, the environment and accruing benefits from the environment we have also seen law through legislative instruments uh, being uh, impediments as well to how well communities uh, accrue benefits from utilization of, uh, or even interaction with natural resources that occur on their land. Uh, but even further than that, we have seen situations where um, communities and citizens are actually unable to actively participate um, in the conservation arena because of one legal hurdle or another. But we are, we are convinced that um, with the environmental legislative and judicial environment we have in Kenya today, it is actually possible um, to use law and policy as a tool to advance um, you know, uh, environmental protection and conservation without forgetting sustainability um, and people's livelihoods. So our core areas of practice are environmental law and policy I am in charge of environmental and policy matters at the farm. Uh, our, our other partners are uh, Veronica Odipo, who's in charge of the commercial legal audit and compliance section of the uh, farm or department of the farm. And what legal audit and compliance means for us is we assist um, organizations to actually um, streamline their policies with national and county laws. We also look at auditing internal processes for organizations 
uh, to streamline them with uh, sustainability laws, sustainability policies, and best practices across the, the, the country, um, and mean across the world. So at this point, uh, may I just uh, allow Ms. Otweo to introduce herself and give a brief background of uh, the minerals and energy law department at the farm, and we can get right on to the presentation uh, that we have here. So uh, Yvonne, I think you have exactly one minute to do that, if you're able to. Just unmute yourself. Mm, she cannot unmute herself unless I do. What's her name? On the list of uh, participants? Yvonne, Yvonne Otwell. I can only see Yvonne Lea. Mm, okay. Is it Yvonne uh, Lea? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, Yvonne? Am I on already? Yes. Oh, sorry. I think my, my video must be having a problem. It's not going on, but I believe you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz, for that uh, introduction of the farm. My name is Yvonne Ocho, just like uh, she has rightly said, and I'm the partner in charge of the energy component of our farm. Yeah, so uh, we, we, we engage a lot of clients. Um, uh, in different areas of the law, but um, I have a specialization in energy and uh, we um, um, help a lot of clients with uh, the energy matters because um, energy business um, involves a lot of compliance and uh, making sure that energy companies and others involved in the process uh, following proper laws and regulations. Therefore, we support a lot of our clients with advising on the laws and policies available. And also we ensure that um, our clients adhere to environmental um, laws and policies because uh, we are big on, 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 on conserving the environment. Therefore, we also support our clients a lot, uh, especially those ones who are involved in infrastructure projects and require environmental impact, impact assessments to carry on their projects. So we support them in that. We also help uh, organizations they negotiate for contracts in the energy space um, ensuring that they all they meet all the required uh, requirements under the law and also policies that are, are in place so those are the kinds of uh, things that we support our clients in and uh, we also ensure that uh, of course energy extraction can be quite harmful and dangerous to the environment but we ensure that um, environmental safety and environmental regulations are upheld by all our clients by ensuring that we send push them to the correct um, areas that they need to rectify and also um, support them by, by developing policies for their organizations to ensure that they adhere to environmental um, regulations and policies that are in place in the country. I think um, that, that is it on my end. Elizabeth, back to you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so then now we get on to uh, the next slide, uh, which I'm hoping, oh, here we go, there we go. Uh, and here we're going to discuss, uh, to, to interrogate what exactly is environmental uh, um, public interest uh, litigation and why uh, it's important. Uh, it's important to, define it first by uh, letting you know that uh, PIL or EPIL, which is what I'll refer to it as we go along, essentially describes the legal tools with, uh, which allow individuals, groups, and communities to challenge government decisions and activities in a court of law for the enforcement of um, public interest. And public interest um, essentially represents anything that is provided uh, for as a public good uh, in the constitution or the laws of the country and anything that affects anyone outside of um, yourself uh, as, as a perpetrator or, or um, as a defendant in the matter. So PIL can also be used to challenge private actions and we will see later on when you're looking at 
some of the various cases that we've had in the jurisdiction, um, what these private actions are and how it's actually possible to go the route of uh, environmental public interest litigation as opposed to a uh, 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 one-on-one suit or, or a plaintiff defendant suit where you're alleging a harm directly to yourself. Um, it's important to note also that it represents um, departure from uh, traditional judicial proceedings uh, since uh, as we shall see in provisions of the constitution and EMCA, litigation is not necessarily filed by the aggrieved person. So with EPIL, uh, we, we will see instances where it's possible for somebody in Wajia County to file a suit aggrieving environmental harm in Lamu County or in Mombasa County. And that will, would not mean that they are uh, precluded from bringing such a suit uh, in court. We'll also interrogate why this is important. Um, we all have a constitutional right to a clean and uh, healthy environment. And uh, EPIL allows us to actually enforce um, such a right. So in general, uh, these cases deal with major environmental social grievances. And they're often used strategically as part of a wider campaign on behalf of disadvantaged and vulnerable groups in, um, in, in, in society. Um, and we can see the utility of uh, EPL for sustainable development in the fact that it has the ability to correct um, decisions and render government authorities accountable to civil society organizations, but even more, uh, importantly accountable um, to private citizens uh, where um, that uh, where the government uh, is so you can have EPL cases against the national government or also against county governments because since um, the dispensation of the new of the constitutional is no longer new it's about 10 years old it's going to its teenage years uh, and we can already see the problems that come in with uh, teenagehood uh, starting to crop up as we as we go along. But in in this dispensation, county governments are actually in charge of uh, certain aspects of uh, environmental law. A good example is that the constitution provides that uh, county governments are in charge of solid waste management and effluent waste management. So in instances where you might find um, that your rights in relation to a clean and healthy environment are being infringed in relation to proper uh, waste management and, and effluent management, um, then uh, the, the suit would then be directed at the county government um, responsible. And we look at, at those issues in terms of Excuse me. We'll look at those issues in terms of the excuse me agencies um, responsible for that. So, how exactly does one institute uh, environmental public uh, litigation cases? Uh, we will see that there are several laws that support uh, public interest litigation in Kenya. Um, in including uh, the constitution. The constitution in uh, articles uh, 42, 69, and 70 have extensive uh, provisions around natural resource management and the environment. And one of the key, um, uh, key uh, issues addressed by the constitution or key rights given is the right to a clean and healthy environment. And the court actually gives rights uh, to citizens uh, when you look at section um, 258, uh, subsection one and two, you'll, have, you'll see a clear outline of exactly who can bring cases uh, in relation to public environmental litigation now. It's important to note at this point when we're discussing the constitution that even if there is a direct right to a clean and healthy environment, you might find that sometimes uh, environmental management decisions directly impact other human rights provided for in the Bill of Rights in the constitution. You might find that your right to health 
has been infringed. You might find uh, your right to liberty, maybe, has, has, has been um, infringed and so on and so forth. So what the constitution does is that it offers you an array of um, avenues that you can use to enforce all the rights that are due to you uh, or to another person for that matter. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, avenues to, to enforce such rights in, in, in a court of law. We also have uh, the framework uh, sort of legislative instrument in the country called the Environmental Management and Coordination Act, which I'm sure a lot of you um, know about. Um, and what EMCA does it, is that it provides an anchoring foundation for all other sectoral laws in respect to the environment. And this means that any other sectoral law, and by sectoral law, I mean uh, laws in relation to water, in relation to forest, in, in relation to wildlife, uh, you know, any other natural resource you can think, for, think of in relation to wetlands, so on and so forth, must be anchored under the principles and uh, clauses provided for by EMCA. And also EMCA gives uh, citizens rights under section three to bring uh, suits to court uh, to, to, to enforce certain um, clauses or rights that are uh, accruable to them as a result of constitutional or legislative provisions. We then have Fair and Administrative Actions Act. And this act specifically deals with administrative actions of government and private bodies as well. Before 2015, this is a 2015 act, before then, uh, one could only bring judicial review uh, under the Fair Administration act, uh, Actions Act uh, against government bodies. And what do we mean by this? So this act deals specifically with instances where government bodies are mandated to do specific things, but they fail to do them or they are not mandated to do specific things and they do them. A good example would be, uh, for instance, uh, citing NEMA uh, uh, under the Fair Administrative Actions Act uh, for failure to uh, say, uh, correct or, or give uh, orders to somebody who's polluting the environment, or even uh, citing uh, the county planning uh, uh, executive office for giving um, you know, a license to build on riparian land or to block somebody else's um, you know, views and access to sunlight and so on and so forth. So it is essentially uh, used specifically in instances where there's a specific provision directing a government body to do something and it has failed to do it. For instance, if we stay for a long time without a proper board at the Kenya Wildlife Service, then this would be the best uh, way to bring such um, an action, by taking uh, Kenya Wildlife Services uh, to court or even the minister, the cabinet secretary as it were, uh, to court under the Fair Administrative Actions Act to compel him to do something or to stop him from doing something. So that's, that's, why, that's where we use the Fair Administrative Actions Act. Um, there are also uh, liability sections, sometimes criminal liability sections provided for in certain um, uh, laws. For instance, the Water Act, uh, the Wildlife Act, so on and so forth. And some of these sections have offenses or they have provisions that would allow us to go to court uh, using those certain mechanisms under those specific acts. Now, uh, enforcing supporting rights through Constitution and Human Rights Division of the High Court is another avenue that we can use. Um, and this is where you're not necessarily directly um, alleging infringement of your right to a clean and healthy environment, but to other rights that have a link to uh, the sort of um, offense or issue that you've brought to court. Um, for instance, perhaps uh, it might be an issue of uh, the right to life, uh, the right to health, so on and so forth. Um, 
Now, there's a difference between the High Court Constitution and Human Rights Commission and a specific court that was that is established by the Constitution called the Environment and Land uh, Court or the ELC. The ELC is a court at the same level with the High Court and it hears all matters in relation to um, to the to the environment. This uh, includes anything you can think of. When you think water, forest, uh, land issues, rent issues, uh, to do with land as well, pollution issues, so on and so forth. All of these are brought to the environment and land court. And uh, when it was established, there was um, a, a, you know a problem in the sense of uh, we didn't have enough cost stations in the country. So you would find that a lot of um, litigants would have to travel long distances to access the environment um, and land court. Uh, but now we, uh, we have a court almost in every single uh, county. So that then anywhere you find a high court, then you will also find um, an environment and land court. Then beneath uh, those two levels of courts, you also have uh, tribunals established by specific acts of um, uh, natural resource management. A very good example here that we, we're going to focus on is the environment, National Environment um, Tribunal, which is provided for by MCA. Uh, and it has its own regulations that then flow uh, from MCA and anything in relation to uh, contravention of a right that is provided for or um, clauses providing for specific things to be done within MCA are then referred um, to uh, the Environment uh, Tribunal. So how this works is that if you have a specific act, yeah, that tells you that in instances of this matter, you take you 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 take the case to the tribunal. A good example is uh, the National Environment Tribunal. I'll refer to it as NET going forward. Um, under MCA, MCA says that if you have any issue with the issuance of an EIA license, you take it directly to the tribunal first. Okay. You don't go to the Environment and Land Court and you don't go to the High Court specifically on the issuance of the license. So this is where you start at the Environment and Land Court. I mean, at the, at the National Environment Tribunal. Once you have gotten your ruling at this tribunal, based on how the tribunal um, uh, ruled, whether in your favor or against you, if it's against, uh, against, against your, your, or your case, then you have a right of appeal to the environment and land court, not to the high court. Okay, so you go to the ELC on appeal on decisions made by the environment and land court. And here you can appeal on issues of fact or on issues of law. And you then have uh, an appeal that would lie from uh, the environment and land court to the Court of Appeal. Now, the Court of Appeal does not have original jurisdiction on environmental matters. What does that mean? It only hears appeals. It cannot hear a case. At the, you cannot file a fresh case at the Court of Appeal. You can only file an appeal from uh, the Environment and Land Court. And after that, the Constitution actually allows one to have an appeal from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court, okay? So the Supreme Court uh, has original uh, and exclusive jurisdiction on matters to do with presidential elections. And it also has um, jurisdiction in matters to do with um, appeals from the Court of Appeal, okay? So that is how some issues on um, Court of Appeal can end up at at, at the Supreme Court. There has been um, debate on whether or not it's possible to refer certain environmental cases um, to the Supreme Court directly. Now, the Supreme Court does hear matters of national importance that are linked to county governments. So in the situation where we might find ourselves having 
conflict in terms of transboundary resources for county governments. And you have two county governments probably uh, disputing boundaries or disputing use of those natural resources. That could be a good example of how such a matter could actually end up at the, um, at the Supreme Court. So uh, before we uh, move forward um, from, from the how, it's important to let you know that uh, the adjudication of cases in this um, sort of several tiers of the judicial system that we have talked about um, actually um, differs slightly. For instance, the National Environment Tribunal does not uh, concern itself too much on laws of evidence, okay? Because the assumption, or, or, or rather the, the, let me use the word the assumption, the assumption of the provision is that anybody can go to the National Environment Tribunal and you do not need um, legal counsel, I mean, uh, you know, legal counsel to represent you. Uh, that does not mean that you would need, um, you know, an advocate to, 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 to represent you in the ELC, or in the court of appeal, the law actually still allows you to to go in your own um, sort of uh, in your own stand. However, there are very stringent rules of procedure and rules of drafting of uh, documents for the ELC and more specifically for the court of appeal. So that if you, if you are not well versed in the drafting procedure of those court documents and the procedures for how to approach the court, uh, you know, what application to make, how to make it, then you're best advised to find legal counsel just so that you don't find yourself in a situation where um, you're having such a hard time communicating to court or sometimes your case might be um, not uh, considered because of a multiplicity of, of technicalities. This is not withstanding the fact that um, the, the general policy is that cases should not be thrown out on pure technicalities. But a lot of the times you might find that that, um, you might find that cases brought uh, before the ELC or the High Court by laymen, and by laymen I mean people who are not trained uh, advocates, is that they have a multiplicity of, of uh, technical, uh, let me use the word abnormalities, number one, or number two, they're not able to articulate uh, what it is they're asking the court to do in, uh, in the manner in which the court would best understand it. And this is where the difference between the ELC and High Court and the, and the NET comes in. The people who sit as members of the National Environmental Tribunal are not necessarily lawyers or advocates by profession. There are laymen who probably have um, uh, qualifications in natural resource management, so on and so forth, mediation, blah, blah, blah. The actual list is, uh, is um, available in MCAM. So what you find is that at the National Environment Tribunal, there is a lot of um, leeway for people arguing cases in court and there's not a lot of emphasis on laws of evidence you know you can only adduce the document in this way you can only do this you can only do that so it's it's very flexible system to allow the common one to bring issues of environmental governance before the tribunal but when you get to the high court and the elc you do find that the judges who sit in those courts are uh, people with over 15 years experience in uh, post-admission experience actually um, in, uh, in law, okay? So you do find uh, that it will be best, uh, one would be best advised to, to uh, seek legal counsel uh, when, when going before um, those two courts. This does not mean that it is a free for all market at the National Environment Tribunal. Uh, those those um, cases are up for, they're actually uh, public. So if you do ever find a link, right now the cases are online, but some of them do happen in physical. If you do ever find yourself in a situation where you have a bit of time, just walk into the National Environment Tribunal offices. They're in South Sea um, at Popo Road, just near Nema. Um, and the offices in, in Upper Hill, but um, just walk in there and see how, how, how it's done. 
So in the other issue when we're talking about how is an interrogation of substantive and procedural law. So we agreed at the beginning of the presentation that uh, some of the reasons why we go to court is so that we are able to offer, um, you know, to, to get government to be accountable for certain things, get government to do certain things, protect the environment, uh, make sure that certain principles of environmental governance are adhered to. So when we talk about substantive law, we're saying that uh, substantive law is uh, a branch of law that refers to the actual rights and obligations that govern people and organization. It includes all laws of general and specific applicability. When you think about substantive law, think about laws that tell you what to do or things that tell government what to do, okay? Government should one, two, three, or uh, NEMA director should one, two, three, four. Uh, KWS uh, director general should do three, four, five. The county compensation committee for wildlife should do uh, X, Y, Z. That is substantive law, okay? Uh, a good example here additionally would be uh, um, the submission of EIA reports. The law requires that for you, when you have a project, you must submit an EIA report. That is a what, okay? Um, when we talk about sub, uh, procedural law, we're talking about how to do it. So you have laws that tell you what to do, but you have additional laws that tell you how to go about it. For instance, you have the what law that tells you you must file uh, uh, an EIA report. But then the second part of that law is a how to do it. And it tells you while you're submitting the or writing the EIA report, you must have public uh, participation. You must go about it this way. You must talk to so-and-so. You must do this and that. Um, you must appoint uh, uh, you know, the director general in consultation with, you, you, you get the gist of it. So you have laws that tells you what, so, uh, the minister or the cabinet secretary shall appoint the director general. And then the second part of it, it tells you how. Uh, must appoint the director general in consultation with, you know, uh, NGOs or in consultation with the public, so on and so forth. So what happens in public interest litigation, especially in regards to environmental public interest litigation, is that you can challenge any one of these two branches of law. Now, the biggest uh, hurdle here is that when you bring substantive, I mean, when you bring procedural law issues, this is the easiest way to win um, an environmental public interest case. Why? Because it's an incredibly low hanging fruit. All you have to show is that the law required them to use root A, but they used root B, okay? What do I mean by that? Uh, the law required them to have public participation by advertising in at least two uh, national newspapers and, that, and putting it in the Kenya Gazette, but they did not do that. How did they do it? They only did it in the Kenya Gazette. So it is a very, um, how do I put it, black and white sort of approach to EPL. And, it's, and a lot of the times when you go through procedural law, uh, those cases, uh, you know, are usually won. Now, the converse of it is that what you ask the court to do, sorry, oops. Yeah, here we are. What you ask uh, the court to do when you're using procedural law to bring an EPL case is that you're asking the court to tell them to do it the right way. So if you're if your um, goal at the end of the EPL is to make sure that something does not happen. For instance, if you're going to court to make sure that the Southern Bypass does not pass through the Nairobi National Park, but you go using procedural law uh, issues and you go to say, these people should have done one, two, three, they didn't do, they should have done one, two, three, uh, uh, you know, they did not do it. Uh, they were meant to go about it in this manner, but they did not follow the procedure. Okay. And the court rules in your favor and tells and says, it is true, we agree with the plaintiff 
that uh, the government agency did not follow the procedure and we therefore direct the government agency to follow the procedure. The government agency then goes back and follows the procedure in accordance to the law. And the outcome is still that the bypass or the, or the standard gauge railway passes through the national park. So you haven't really gotten uh, the clear objective that you wanted. But if you use substantive law, which is a lot harder to prove, it, not, not really to prove, but it's, 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 a, it's a longer shot, if I can use that word, uh, essentially because you're trying to explain principles and to articulate principles and, of environmental governance to a tribunal or to a court of law. Not, a lot of the times you might be going saying, yes, they followed the law, but the law is wrong. Yes, they followed the law, but the law does not address, adequately address issues of sustainable development, or it misinterprets sustainable development. Or yes, they followed the law, but the outcome of following the law is going to endanger a highly and critically endangered species, okay? Or it is passing through a critically important corridor. Okay, so then you're asking the court to interrogate and to balance between those two interests. Balance between the interest of conservation vis-a-vis, -vis, um, in this particular case that I've given, uh, development. So as you can see, it is a longer route to use substantive law, but ultimately it gives you better results in terms of number one, providing precedent case uh, setting instances where you're now able in the future to go to court and say the high court in this matter ruled that where roads pass through uh, critically important corridors that have been gazetted or that have been uh, let's use the word gazetted that have been gazetted then such development should not be allowed irrespective of whether they do public participation irrespective of whether they follow the procedure that's not what you're talking about and that is why when clients come to us in relation to environmental public litigation, we usually ask the question, what is it that you want to get out of this? Do you want them to follow the law, for instance? Do you want to make sure that um, communities are represented on the KWS board, meaning that uh, the appointing authority must follow the procedure that's given? Or do you want to change the law in respect of, instead of just saying that communities are represented because you have one member who identifies as a community, you want to make sure that the person who sits on the KWS board representing communities has been properly elected or appointed by the communities themselves. Because it is one thing to say, this person belongs to community XYZ, they sit at the KWS board representing communities. It is quite another thing to say, communities across the country got together and chose this one person to represent them on the KWS board. So with those two examples, you're able to see how it's important to be very clear in your mind exactly what it is you're asking the court to do. And the, maybe the last thing to say here in respect to this is that courts in Kenya give you what you ask for. So there are very few instances uh, we've seen uh, a couple of instances in Tanzania. We've seen one or two instances in Kenya, but that they have been appealed where courts gave orders that were not prayed for. So when you're going to court and saying, you know, I'm aggrieved by this pollution that's happening here and here, you're not just going to court to complain. Nobody has time for your complaining. You're going to court to tell the court, yes, this person is aggrieving uh, our rights to a clean and healthy environment, we want you, the court or the tribunal, to issue this and this and these orders. So the court listens to your side of the story, to the other person's side of the story, and makes a decision based on what you asked for. So if you're not clear on what exactly it is you want to get at the end of the process, you might find that the things you actually ask for do not give you the outcome that you desire. So it's important to be very strategic when looking at these things. And, and uh, that is why it's important not to have reactionary uh, public interest litigation. There is a place for preventative public interest litigation, okay? Where you're not going to go to say, this has already happened, please make it stop. 
but you're going to court to say this might happen and you adduce evidence to show why there is a likelihood of that, for instance, you have come across a submission for approval uh, by a developer um, to develop, say, Uhuru Park. And you're going to go to say, before the EIA license is issued, we are apprehensive that this is going to do one, two, three. And therefore, there's a place for public interest litigation, not only uh, to, to stop things from happening, but to prevent things from happening. And that is a more strategic approach. So we're urging you in all of your uh, organizations and as you talk to your colleagues, think about these things a lot more strategically as opposed to having knee-jerk re reactions of, oh, this has happened, let's go to court. Or this has happened, let's go to court. And looking at it from a wide uh, perspective and from a ecosystem-wide approach as opposed to project level uh, approach. So now that we've dealt with uh, the sort of anchoring issues uh, in terms of the how, let's talk about exactly what happens. Yes, now you've, you have a strategic approach to it. Uh, you have your defendant, you have your plaintiff. Uh, how do you go about it? So you file your documents, which you, your advocate is going to help you to uh, put together uh, through the registry for the um, tribunal or the court that you're going to use. So you don't go directly to the judge or directly to court. You first go to the registrar who's in charge of the documentation of the, of, of, of the court or the tribunal and you say, here are my documents, this is what I am challenging. Your case is then assigned a case number, right? Uh, uh, and it is scheduled for uh, mention and hearing at the first instance. Now, what happens a lot of the time is that you find through certificates of urgency, which is how you communicate to the court that this is so important. I don't have time to go to the defendant and alert them. I'm coming to you directly to ask you to stop before we, to stop this issue before we continue to litigate it. For instance, if um, we wake up tomorrow morning and uh, there is construct, there are construction materials that are being poured, I don't know, in the middle of Uhuru Park or in the middle of Nairobi National Park. Our first instance is to communicate to the court that this is extremely urgent, please stop it as we litigate and find out what's going on. So you, a lot of the times people go through certificate of urgency and this is usually as a result of not having preventative um, public interest litigation, but reactive public interest litigation. Once that is done, uh, the court hears you or the court decides it's not really that urgent, you're just being dramatic and there's no need to stop the development, let's hear the case. So irrespective of whatever happens, the case proceeds. At this time, the defendant, the person that you have sued, is brought to court. A lot of the times, you sue the private individual who is actually directly responsible for uh, the thing that is infringing your rights. For instance, if it's an industry that's spewing effluence into a river, or if it's an industry that's not sort, uh, filtering air pollution, or it is someone who is putting up a development where they should not. But you also ensure that you tie in the government agency that was responsible for giving that license. So it could be an EIA license, it could be a license under the Wildlife Conservation and Management Act. For instance, uh, you might find that um, maybe somebody wants to start a conservancy and get conservancy um, registration documents from KWS, but they only have 50 acres of land, right? Or 100 acres of land for that matter. Um, so you you tie in the government agency that gave the license as well as a private person. It could be a company or a natural person who is doing the actual thing so that the court is able to interrogate and you're able to actually show and give and secure orders as against the government agency either to revoke the license and also against the private developer to stop it, whatever it is um, that they are doing. Now, a lot of the times, and this is where I think Lucy was um, alluding to uh, uh, at the beginning of the meeting, where 
a lot of the instances there are things we call or procedures we call preliminary objections. These are, I don't want to say, use the word tactics because it sounds a little bit off, uh, but uh, these are, let's use the word tactics, tactics used by defendants uh, or any other party in the, in the proceedings to bring to the attention of the court certain things that will make sure that the matter does not proceed. What are some of these things? Issues to do, for instance, with jurisdiction. Maybe you brought the matter to the high court. It's a land matter, it's a land and environment matter, but you brought it to the high court. A preliminary objection in that instance would be for the other counsel to say, we have an objection, we have a first instance objection before even the judge or the tribunal hears this matter, that this matter should not actually be in this court. It should be elsewhere or it should not even be in any court of law whatsoever. That is what we call a preliminary objections. A lot of the times uh, when your defense counsel, you use everything, all arsenal that is at your disposal to stop uh, uh, to stop the proceedings against your client. One of those uh, tools that you can use or that I use are preliminary objections. And what happens is that this prolongs the matter. So you might find that you've gone for a whole year and all you're listening to or arguing in court is whether or not the case sh should proceed and not actually substantive matters. And the law is any preliminary objection is raised by a party in a case that must be had first. The court cannot proceed with the substantive issue until the issue of the preliminary objection has been sorted out, there is a ruling and people have moved on. So that process can take quite a number of, uh, quite a bit of time. Um, and it's also, it can also be misused as a um, delaying tactic for cases that people don't want to proceed. There is also contempt proceedings in court that can, that can be brought against a, a party. What are contempt proceedings? Contempt proceedings are proceedings that are brought by a party alleging that a certain individual, whether they are parties to the suit, mostly when they are parties to the suit, are con contemptuous of the proceedings of court. That is, they don't respect the court. Um, this can be issues to do with um, uh, talking about the matter while it's still proceeding in court, um, alleging mis mis uh, misappropriative in court proceedings, so on and so forth. Or uh, somebody has been given, um, the court gave an order that has not been uh, followed through by a certain party, and that is then put, uh, um, as a contempt of court proceeding. Now, once you've sorted out the initial things to do with preliminary objections and contempt of court proceedings on and so forth, then you can get into actually arguing your case in court and you then bring evidence. Now, it's important to uh, put across at this juncture that courts deal with things that you can prove. It does not matter that you know. It does not matter that you know somebody who knows. It does not matter whether you feel in your heart that it should not happen. The court is not concerned with your heart or your feelings or anything else outside of proof that you can bring to court. So if you're talking about, uh, for instance, effluent waste management, and you bring a matter to court uh, um, that so-and-so is uh, polluting Nairobi River, but you actually did not, you know, or because somebody told you, in fact, let's call them uh, uh, Elizabeth and uh, Lucy and Sheila. So Elizabeth goes to court to say, oh, I mean, Elizabeth is told by Sheila, you know, I saw Lucy's employee pouring waste or, or employees uh, pouring waste into the river. And Elizabeth decides to, to run to court. The question that the court will ask is, how sure are you that it's Lucy or Lucy's employees? You cannot go to court to say, it's because I know that they work for them. I've seen them go to the office from 
8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Every single day, I'm sure that they go to the office. She has come to meetings with that particular person. She has introduced that person to me and so on and so But Lucy will come and say, I do not have an existing employment or any contract with this person who is being alleged to um, have polluted the river. In fact, they are a foreigner to me. They come to my office perpetually looking for jobs. Or they come to my office, I don't know, because maybe somebody else is, is have come to see somebody else. I have no idea what they're in fact doing in my office. In fact, Lucy thanks you for bringing to her attention that there is a stranger who comes to her office. You understand what I mean? So then what we need to emphasize here, that because environmental matters and especially public interest environmental matters are highly emotive. They are, bring, they are brought to court uh, as a result of a person's need to enforce and to protect public interest and to protect our natural resources. There is a lot of um, emotion, and I don't use the word emotion in a negative way, but there's a lot of passion and emotion involved in such matters, which often clouds the fact that you need actual evidence. And sometimes this is where a lot of uh, people feel. So after you've done that and uh, you know, you've been examined. A, a good, maybe another uh, point to make here is that one of the best ways to bring uh, evidence to court is also to bring expert witnesses. Because we know that a lot of people in the conservation space are experts in their field. They are doctors in ecology. They are doctors in natural resource management. They are doctors or, or even people with, you know, lots of years of experience in project implementation, in EIAs, and so on and so forth. The court actually, or the laws, actually allow you to bring these people to court, table their, uh, their qualifications, and say, we are bringing this person as an expert into the matter to prove some of the things you're saying. For instance, if you're proving that an EIA was not properly done because it did not consider one, two, three, or it considered it and decided, for instance, you might have an EIA that considers that an area is not an important bad area, okay, uh, or, an, or a critical corridor for bad migration, and that putting up a skyscraper there is not going to affect the bad population. The court actually allows you to bring expert witnesses, but you must prove that they're experts. You don't just bring someone who has a high school degree, uh, I mean a high school diploma, but or, or even two years expertise in the field. You must have a proper expert who is respected in the fraternity in which they are an expert, bring their qualifications and tell the court, this particular witness is going to prove to you uh, how, um, the, the, how this corridor is actually important for bad migration and this skyscraper should not go up. Uh, the defendant's case follows the same sort of procedure in terms of them adducing matters with, with evidence and uh, them uh, defending themselves or defending why they did something. So it's not essentially different in terms of how they argue their cases excuse me, to court. Uh, we then have the matter of judici judicial discretion, sorry. And this is where a lot of, we find quite a number of issues. Whereas the law, a lot of laws or most of the laws actually uh, provide the direction with which uh, liability should be assigned and how that should be sorted out, you do find that there are certain laws that provide a wide array of judicial discretion, okay? In terms of it is up to the judge or up to the tribunal to decide how to go about this matter that you've brought for uh, the court. So for instance, you might come to court arguing that uh, public participation was not uh, adequate or efficient. So it is upon the court to translate and to define what adequate and sufficient public participation is, which is why it's incredibly important during the evidentiary phase to explain in all, because there's no time limit when you're told, okay, bring, bring forward your case. The court does not tell you that you must, you must only bring two witnesses. If you want 50 witnesses uh, or, or you know, bundles of documents uh, filling two pickups, you're happy to bring them. But there's also the converse side of 
you know, judges will be tired reading through all of that material. So in terms of judicial discretion, you must look at number one, where we started, what are you asking the court to do? You look at, does the law give that judicial officer, officer discretion to look, uh, to, to make the, the ruling based on what he deems best? Is there a spectrum? For instance, in criminal cases, you might find that um, uh, liability when one has been um, found guilty of an offense, then the penalty is, say, uh, you know, sentences or sentence uh, being sentenced to not more than 10 years in prison. So it means that the, judici the judi judicial officer, sorry, has the opportunity to give between zero and 10 years in, in, in imprisonment for that particular offense. And that's the same case with, with some of these um, issues. So make sure that what you're asking the court to do is very clear that you articulate your matters very clearly. If there are certain terms that you want defined or there's a certain definition you want to see go through, then you must make sure that that definition makes it to the court documents that you submit. So that you tell the court, yes, the law says that they should do adequate and efficient public participation. But to us, adequate and efficient public participation does not mean talking to five people. And why does it not mean talking to five people? Because in this jurisdiction, this is done. Because this project affects millions of people, which you know cannot be decided by only five of them, so on and so forth. And lastly, they, we would like to uh, address the issue of corruption and influence peddling. What this means is that a lot of times we have seen uh, clients who get a little bit um, anxious or jittery when we start having, at the beginning of the case, preliminary objections um, and other um, preliminary procedures before the case starts. Or you find that the court's diary is so full that you're given a hearing date three or four or six months you know, into the future. And because we as advocates know that uh, this is the, you know, this is what is happening in the court for, uh, uh, right now. For instance, last year we had a lot of issues in terms of getting hearing dates. Um, there were there were cases we filed in November of last year, and our first hearing case, uh, because it was not a certificate of urgency matter, our first hearing was slotted for I think it's going to be on October third of this year. So that's almost a year, you know, in advance where you have filed a matter but you still don't have um, audience with the court. And uh, a lot of lay people then get discouraged by that process at this preliminary stage, such that thoughts of corruption and influence peddling start coming into their minds. You find clients who come into your office and ask you, so who do you know? Do you know that magistrate? You know, I had that magistrate usually, or that judge usually likes to have an evening cup of coffee at Serena at 4 p.m. Do you think you might bump into him such things? I think it's quite important um, to reiterate that um, in as much as such instances happen, it is critical that you do not accuse a sitting or a presiding judge or a presiding tribunal for that matter of any sort of impropriety or corruption if you do not have the evidence to back it up. Um, and it's also important to uh, state at this point that a lot of times when people think about judges and tribunals, they think of them in abstract terms, like we're going to court. The court has, the, even the reporting a lot of the times when you read newspapers, the court decided that one, two, three, the court did. So the human element is actually quite removed from the reporting. But what, it's, what is most critical to bear in mind is that those judges and those members of tribunals and those magistrates are human beings. They're people with feelings, they're people with emotions, they're people who, have families who go back home and work, uh, who are who have strong convictions one way or another, so on and so forth. So it's important, even as you litigate, to bear, to keep that at the back of your mind that you're not talking to the abstract quote unquote court. You're actually talking to a real human being who has real reasoning and whose reasoning. Uh, 
sway one way or another, especially in matters of, of uh, public interest. Maybe an example that I, that I can give here, outside of environmental law, is a public interest matter bring, uh, being brought in respect of gay rights, for instance. If you have a liberal judge sitting to hear that ruling, you more or less know how the, 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 the matter will sway. If you have a conservative judge who, excuse me, goes to court, I mean, goes to, uh, to church every Sunday, they have fellowship every evening at their house, they start their court sessions, or, or uh, when they get to court, the first thing they do is pray, so on and so forth. You also have, you also have an idea of how that is going to, to go. And a good thing, maybe a good thing to also mention here, is that the reason we are in business as advocates is that there's no right or wrong answer in law, not even in law, in litigation. That is why you go to court and argue as best as you can. There is, it's like, I, I usually like to say that the law is like the Bible. Whatever your stand is, you will find something within the legal framework to support your stand. And it is upon you to use whatever it is to articulate as best as you can uh, your position to courts. But also don't forget that courts are real um, human beings, have real human beings uh, behind them. So we're going to have a look at some EPL cases across um, the country and before the country region. But one of the things that I would like to mention as we get onto this last segment of the presentation is that the reason EPL is incredibly important as we shall uh, see as we are concluding is that it offers an opportunity for number one, interpretation and interpretation of the application of legislative laws. It allows us to understand that the law, that is the act, maybe the Wildlife Act, the Forest Act, MCAS, so on and so forth, says this. But when you actually go to the ground to implement it, how should you implement it? What actually um, should you, what are the principles that, that, that should anchor your implementation of that particular act? Uh, and what this does is, is, is that it provides precedence or a history of how decisions should be made or how natural resources should be managed. And a very good um, uh, illustration of this is the, is the principle of law or, or um, let's say of law of judicial precedence where tribunals are bound by the decisions of the environment and land court the environment and land court is bound, meaning they must comply. They cannot rule against. So if there was a case uh, at, the, at the environment and land court that said that uh, when the law talks about public participation, it means that every single person should be given an opportunity to not only air the, their views, but the person seeking public participation should demonstrate how they have considered their views. And if they reject those views, they should give credible scientific based reasons why they have rejected that view. So if that's the ruling in this instance for the Environment and Land Court, the tribunal which is under the Environment and Land Court in terms of hierarchy, the tribunal cannot then uh, make a ruling that says instead of what the Environment and Land Court has outlined as effective public participation. For us, public particip participation means you just put it in the Kenya Gazette. If you get a reply, well and good. If you get memorandums, well and good. You don't have to prove to anyone that you read the memorandum or you discussed it or you uh, made uh, use of it in your decision. So if the Environment and Land Court says, in this instance, this is the way it should be applied, then any cases brought to the Environment Tribunal should always rule in that particular um, subject matter or that particular issue the same way that the ELC ruled. And then the ELC is bound by the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal is bound by the Supreme Court. Now, the difference is this, that the Supreme Court is not bound by the decisions of its, by its own decisions. So if the Supreme Court in 2021 
makes the ruling that public participation should include, uh, agrees with, let's say, agrees with the uh, ELC, that uh, public participation should include, um, you know, extensive uh, gathering of views and a demonstration that those views were considered. And if they were not considered, uh, uh, sort of explanation on why based on data or science, okay? So if the court, if the Supreme Court rules that in 2021, and in 2025, the Supreme Court rules says, we've actually changed our minds. We have decided that public participation should only, uh, people should only demonstrate that they have received views and that they have documented the views, that's it. So it, 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 it would not be, uh, you know, so one cannot argue that there's a 2021 decision of the Supreme Court. They are not, um, uh, you know, bound by their own decisions. Why that discussion is important to these cases that we're going to have a quick look at is that these cases then offer precedent in terms of how such decisions will be dealt with in the future. And perhaps uh, before we start with this, it's important to look at um, the mother of, I call, I call the case the mother of uh, public, environmental public interest uh, litigation, which is a case uh, that was filed by Wangari Mathai, the late uh, Professor Wangari Mathai in 1989 uh, uh, against the Kenya Media Times Trust um, when they wanted to build the, the the Times Trust uh, Towers, the Media Towers, I think it was, at um, Uhuru Park. And one of the things that came out of there was that, you know, one needs to demonstrate specific harm to them, that you cannot be bring cases on behalf of somebody else. You have to demonstrate how such a matter affects you. But we thank, um, uh, we thank God that that has actually uh, been scrapped off by the constitution and now you're able to bring cases against anything uh, in terms of natural resource management, whether or not it affects you directly. So what, some cases that we picked um, uh, in terms of uh, president's value is this first one of uh, Peter and another versus director general of NEMA. And it was specifically around uh, construction of a church building in a community forest. Uh, and in the case, the, the tribunal canceled the EIA license uh, that had been granted to the church and also re revoked NEMA's letter of uh, development approval that, that had been issued uh, to the church. And it's one of the many instances here that the tribunal, that is the National Environment Tribunal, has actually positively contributed to environmental conservation and protection of environmental rights of a particular uh, group and, and um, the, 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 the public in general. And the case was not actually based on whether or not there was public participation. It was on the fact that uh, the community forest land had more utility to the public and to, and to um, the community than it did to the, to the, to the church and that it would de destroy uh, natural resources. The building of the church would then destroy natural resources within the, the forest land. The other case would be um, Wawero v. Republic, um, where the court sort of emphasized section three of MCA which essentially requires that uh, court take into account universal principles when determining environment cases. Why this is very important is that it is, it's, it's not a tribunal case, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a high court case. Um, and the fact that the court said that uh, environmental, uh, international, I mean, environmental principles set out in EMCA form part of customary law which form of international customary law, which forms part of our laws as, a, as Kenya, it means that you can now, using the, the ruling of this case, argue a case at the uh, environment tribunal, urging the tribunal to take cognizant of environmental principles, okay? So if that principle, one of the environmental principles is prevention of harm or the precautionary principle, then this is a very good case 
that offers us the opportunity to use preventative public interest litigation because prevention of harm and precautionary principle are parts of, um, have now been uh, stamped as, as forming part of our laws and courts have been directed through the ruling of this case to actually consider those principles of environmental uh, conservation when, when making um, rulings. Uh, another case that we want to uh, highlight is by the African Network for Animal Welfare and the Attorney General of uh, Tanzania. This case was filed at uh, the East African Court of Justice, uh, you know, challenging the Tanzanian government's um, uh, decision to build a commercial highway across the Serengeti and, um, you know, uh, the court ruled that the government could actually not build such a road across uh, that section of the Serengeti, essentially because it harmed um, uh, the, the ecosystem. And this is a good example how, uh, as we all know, ANO is headquartered in, excuse, in Nairobi, but the fact that they're headquartered in Nairobi did not um, preclude them from addressing uh, regional issues of natural resource uh, management or, or of environmental importance. And the fact that we, we have an avenue of uh, addressing some of these issues through the East African Court of Justice, um, as well as national uh, courts. But now the, the thing to make note here is that you can only bring uh, cases in the East African Court of Justice uh, challenging a government's um, compliance with the East African Community Treaty. So you show which specific section of the East African Community Treaty that they have, um, sort of, well, I mean, which specific article, and um, you show which specific article that that country has contravened, uh, and you will then have, be able to uh, possibly articulate uh, or properly articulate those issues at the ESCJ. So this is not something that you you bring that lies outside the East African Community Treaty. So uh, as we wind up, what are some of the issues that uh, must be addressed um, when you're talking about EPIL? Uh, Number one, issues of local standi, meaning that you don't need to have standing in terms of uh, showing direct damage to you as an individual to bring a matter on environmental uh, uh, importance to a court. Um, the other issue to bear the court of other uh, back of our minds is that a lot of people are afraid in terms of costs of the suit because in a lot of cases you do find that uh, uh, costs are rewarded, meaning the court decides who should pay for that entire uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, endeavor or the entire suit, meaning paying for the legal cost of the plaintiff and the defendant in a lot of civil cases. Uh, but in environmental public interest litigation, and essentially in public interest litigation, uh, the courts are hesitant to assign costs unless it is a waste of the court's time. Unless you're coming to court uh, on frivolous grounds, the, cost, the court does not then ask the plaintiff or the person bringing the case to pay for the costs of the defendant's legal fees. Uh, the other issue uh, that could be a challenge is the implementation of judgments, especially when uh, judgments are given against uh, powerful government uh, offices. Um, therefore, uh, they become, uh, you know, difficult to enforce, not really difficult to enforce, but the government agency that has been directed by a ruling or a judgment to do something refuses to actually do it. So how do you go about ensuring um, that that actually happens or that governments follow those directives? a good way to go about it would be to appeal it or to cite a contempt of court proceedings against the person holding uh, that particular office. The other issue that uh, I think is, is uh, one of the things that uh, advocates um, where there's a little bit of a gray area is that public interest, a lot of the times you'll find that public interest litigation cases 
are usually brought by non-governmental organizations on behalf of communities, right? So you might find people like uh, maybe the CAK have sued on behalf of communities living here and here. Or you might find um, that uh, this, uh, the, let's say, I don't know, friends of Lake Trukana, uh, you know, as give instructions to, or, or, or uh, get, contract an attorney or an advocate to represent communities within that area. And therefore the question becomes, especially in terms of client advocate relations, in that instance, who is the client to the advocate? Is it the person they have signed the contract with, meaning friends of Lake Trukana, all right? Or Ano for this, uh, not even Ano for this, let's go with friends of Lake Trukana. So are you representing as an advocate, uh, friends of Lake Trukana or are your clients the communities that are being represented? And it's important to make this distinction before you uh, contract advocates so that in instances where you know, conflict of interest arises, where the community uh, decides to go or, or, or the community and the NGO do not agree on a specific matter, then in the advocates, uh, mind and, and, and in discharging their duties. They're very clear who their client is so that they're not accused of negligence further down the road. So that you don't find that uh, maybe uh, you have an NGO called ABC. So you have ABC NGO, ABC Conservation, um, ABC Conservation Trust, for instance, uh, and ABC Conservation Trust uh, contracts uh, Elizabeth as their advocate to represent communities living in Mount Kenya forest. Okay. So the case is being argued for the interest of the people living in Mount Kenya forest. However, the person who has signed the contract with the advocate is ABC Trust Limited. Okay. I mean, ABC Conservation Trust. So what happens when, say, there is issues of bribery by ABC staff? or let's say the developer comes and buys out the entire community and tells the community, I will give each one of you bursaries for all your children for the next one year, as long as you drop this case, all right? So in that, there's, there's the need to be very clear in terms of those relationships. And then we've already addressed the issue of evidence versus passion and emotion. So these are just uh, utilities of EPL that we've discussed before, encouragement of government accountability. Uh, it supplements the criminal justice system. Um, it allows courts, uh, courts to clarify and interpret the law. Um, it, uh, some of the disadvantages are you know, leaving public interest litigants um, that are unsuccessful with an obligation to pay the unsubstantial costs of the state and other parties, although this may be, um, this is in very few situations. Uh, there is heavy reliance on uh, uh, lawyers and the need for financial backing of the parties because legal services are, are, are quite expensive in respect of the time spent. Um, and the result in court judgments, which gov government agencies may fail to uh, implement uh, properly. So in conclusion, uh, we are of the opinion that public interest litigation is a last resort and alternative dispute resolution is the first line of defense, especially in preventative public interest litigation. Before you go to court to prevent something from happening, try arbitrating the issue, try getting a mediator to sort out the issues because such um, uh, solutions are uh, better suited to build uh, relationships uh, in the future. And also it is less expensive and less adversarial in terms of, um, you know, uh, thought uh, process and so on and so forth. And then um, the other issue is um, that EPL does rely highly on uh, the synergies in the conservation sector so that you don't have 
conservation organizations go, you know, giving different um, sort of uh, statements in regards to the same issue. Um, and then there is uh, the place of advocacy and campaigning that we began the presentation by saying that it is supported and, and occurs as part of a larger campaign in a natural resource uh, management issue. And we've obviously discussed preventative advocacy and preventative uh, public interest litigation. I would like to end there and perhaps then field questions going forward. I hope that that has offered a little bit of uh, utility for you. Uh, thank you very much for giving um, your attention for the, I think, 45 to one hour minutes that have passed. Thank you. Over to you, Sheila. Thank you so much, uh, Liz, for the wonderful presentation. Um, my takeaway are the five points you shared, the locals study uh, costs of the suit, implementation and judgments, instructions by clients and evidence versus emotions. Uh, so for any cases that we would like to take up, um, ensure that you have enough evidence and you're not filing it because you are mad, you are sad, you are angry, but because you have enough evidence to show that um, the case that you're filing is strong enough. Uh, so we will take questions and we have some questions here. So I will read as you answer uh, Elizabeth. So the first question is from Gilbert Koech. Uh, we have seen projects such as SGR, roads, ETC, traversing through gazetted areas, most of the time forcibly by the government. What remedy does the law have to such instances? Uh, can we take them in batches of five just so that we are able to move along uh, a little okay. bit faster? Okay. So the second question is, what are the cost implications of a public litigation interest, uh, public interest litigation case, I think? Uh, can foreigners or non-Kenyan residents also file EPIs? And then Moses is asking, as an activist, how can you be able to secure a government land that has been grabbed by wealthy people and started using them for their own benefits, where it has been, it was being used for uh, dumping. Then Diana is saying, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, she has learned a lot. Thank you for breaking down complex matters to be easily understood. Her question is, when you file a case, is there a way to track progress? And she thanks you for speaking on evidence, which is crucial. The challenge is always gathering this evidence and also in instances where there are witnesses, how can they be protected? So I think you can answer those first. All right, there we are. Um, thank you very much for those questions. Perhaps uh, we start with a question on uh, witness uh, protection. Um, a lot of the times um, there, there will be instances where you, you will need witness protection and we do have a witness protection act uh, where you apply through, uh, and it's usually used by um, under criminal procedure uh, because uh, the assumption is that the witnesses in criminal law are the ones perhaps highly at risk. But I, I do know that it would be possible to use it um, for, for such a case. But uh, there is an entire procedure under the Act on, on how you apply through the Office of the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions um, and through the AG. Uh, I mean, to the AG. And uh, what you do is that you show how or why the witness needs protection. And there are several levels of, of that protection. There is provision of um, police escort or pro police uh, uh, sort of security, uh, with the highest being you know, change of identity and all of those wonderful dramatic things you see in, in um, 
thriller movies from Hollywood. So it is possible. You just there's a there's a proceed on how you do it. Um, it is possible to also track uh, cases, um, and I think one of the I would say best things about the Kenyan um, judicial system is that uh, for every court there is a registry, and all you have to do because it's a it's a public record, you just show up as long as you know the case number or the parties, then you're able to go to the registry and uh, give, you know, ask for the information on the file, uh, essentially because it's public uh, uh, information, other than instances where the matters are uh, sensitive, for instance, children's matters or divorce proceedings, that sort of thing. Uh, but um, with, with environmental cases, it's possible to just go to the tribunal registry or to the ELC registry uh, where it's located. Uh, government land grabbing by wealthy individuals. Uh, so a lot of these um, instances um, will involve a high sort of investment in terms of finding the proof that it has happened and uh, reporting it to the land uh, registrar in terms of if titles have moved hands on and so forth. And a lot of the times you'll find that, uh, you know, green cards have gotten lost, files have gotten lost within the registry, but um, there are avenues within which this can be done. Um, so my best advice there will be to start with the registry um, and get the actual facts, because you remember what we said at the beginning, that it's important to have uh, the facts of the case before you, you go to court. A lot of the times you find that, uh, for instance, there's a case that uh, we were handling about two, two years ago where the proprietor of the land had been allocated that land by um, President Moy in the 80s, but he didn't do anything about it. He just got the allocation letter and he didn't follow through the entire process of adjudicating the land until the 2000s. And already there was quarters on the land. So um, when in his attempt to reclaim back his land, the accusation was that he's trying to, to grab public land. So it's important to have the actual facts of the case and you can only get those um, at government registries. Um, can foreigners file? There is nothing precluding a foreigner from um, filing uh, such a case. Um, because Bill of Rights are universal, okay? And constitutional rights apply to anyone within the jurisdiction of the country. So there would be nothing precluding you in law. Uh, the only question is the perception and the interpretation in the court of public perception, if, if I can call it that. Um, so there's a lot of optics around it to consider and not just the law. And that's why we keep saying that the law does not operate in a vacuum, that there are a lot of other factors that, that, that uh, come into play um, in terms of public interest litigation. Uh, cost implications. Uh, I'm not sure whether this refers to legal fees. So legal fees depend um, are uh, provided for by the advocates remuneration order that provides for a floor, uh, the amount that advocates cannot charge ad under. So you might find for the registration of companies, uh, that uh, that order or that law says that advocates cannot charge less than 60,000, but they can charge upwards of 60,000. So it depends on who you go to, but there's a cap in terms of how much you cannot pay below. It also depends on the complexity of the matter. It depends on whether you're offering uh, pro bono services in the matter as well. Um, also in terms of the court making the, I mean, making the ruling that um, people uh, or public interest litigants should pay for costs of the government agencies, that, that has actually not happened um, as I know of in terms of public interest litigation in the country, unless it's a purely frivolous matter and you've, you, you know, people can demonstrate or the court can see that you're wasting its time. Um, what are some of the remedies for, excuse me, remedies for uh, infrastructure passing through 
protected areas. The Wildlife Act has quite extent, extensive uh, sort of clauses or, or uh, provisions in respect to uh, protected areas and development within those protected areas. So in instances where you find that that has been contravened, then our advice would be to follow the alternative dispute resolution method by uh, writing to and having dialogue with the various government agencies. If that then fails, then you're able to, the law allows you to go to court to, to block such uh, a development. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so Trish is asking in regards with the media, where do you draw the line on what you can talk about and what you can't when a case is ongoing? Uh, Nyaga is asking, what is the criteria for considering a case as a major or minor environmental and social grievance? And then Diana uh, I, I, says, I didn't hear the second question, sorry. Uh, Nyaga is asking, what is the criteria for considering a case as a major or minor environmental and social grievance. And then Diana is asking, the example of using procedural law, my concern is co getting the information beforehand. Most of the PIL is reactive because of lack of consultation and challenges with access to information. Getting information is not easy unless you get through other sources from networks. Uh, Nyaga again says, uh, if we have cases where CAK has represented communities, especially in the coast region, where environmental injustices are numerous. I think you can answer that. Sorry, what was the last one about communities? Um, asking if CAK has cases um, representing communities, especially in the coast, where environmental injustices are numerous? Um, I, I, I will not be able to answer on the CAK one. I, I am not representing CAK on any coastal matters. So perhaps maybe they have engaged another attorney. I'm not quite sure. I think that might be a question to be answered by either Sheila or Lucy. Um, getting information beforehand for litigation. At the beginning of the presentation, we we're talking about different ways that you can go to the high court. Uh, one of the supporting rights in the constitution is uh, access to information, the right to access to information, which where if you ask for the information from the government entity and you can prove that you've written letters, they have not replied or they've replied and said, we're not going to give you, then you can go to the high court to say that they are infringing on your right to access to information, especially if it's public information and it does not contravene um, any uh, sections or laws in respect of the official government uh, secrets act, so on and so forth. Like you're not, if you're not going to ask, you know, give us the military uh, plans and such things. But if it's environmental law, um, then it's possible to, to use that to access the information. And especially if you are going on a certificate of urgency, especially if it's an environmental issue that can, um, that has potential to quickly and negatively impact people's um, health and also, and so that's, that's one way that you can do that. Uh, but I, I, I keep encouraging people before you go the litigation route, it's always best to try the more uh, amicable routes and you might find that if you don't find the information um, with uh, NEMA or with one government agency, you might find it with another. So for instance, you might not find um, the KWS reply to an EIA, but you can access the EIA from NEMA. So you go to NEMA and that EIA will include the KWS response. So there are different strategies that you can use. And I would uh, advise that you explore all of those before you go the education route. Um, difference between major uh, environmental social grievances and minor ones. Um, I think it's on a case to case basis. But the beauty about our constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment is that it encompasses everything. 
So it encompasses uh, a clean and healthy environment in respect to an employer who is uh, letting people smoke inside the building or in a common working area, which is pollution, so on and so forth. It encompasses uh, pollution from a small industry. Like you, you can use, it's, it's a wide covering umbrella and the law does not look at it in terms of this is minor and this is major, as long as it fits into, constitu into the constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. If you can prove that, then it does not matter whether it's small or, or big, whether it's a coal plant in Lamu or it's a small community forest um, anywhere in the country. Um, what can you, what was the first question? What can you say about uh, a case where what I think it was on. I, I actually did not capture that properly. With regards can you remember to the, media, where do you draw the line on what you can talk about or you cannot uh, talk about when a case is ongoing? Ah, there we go. Thank you. So, um, in regards to media, you can report facts, but you cannot report, not even media, everybody essentially. You report facts, you don't report opinion. You report that the case was brought by Liz and they argued in court X, Y, Z, and the judge said, but you can say, based on what the judge says, we think he's biased, we think he's this. Based on how Elizabeth argued or the case brought forward by the defendant, we think this and this. So leave opinions out of it and just report the facts of the matter. Uh, do we have any more? I think those were the... No, we, we still have quite a number. Comment on okay. involvement of experts in environment and natural oh. resource. Sorry, comment on? Involvement of experts in environment and natural resource. Uh, what support can NGOs in the environment space offer to cure issues where residential places are constructed in industrial zone, which leads to unnecessary litigation should the laws on zoning have been followed duly? Our public is quick to point fault at industry, whereas it is the estate investors who move into their spaces. Um, the other one, one of the international NGOs collected a number of signatures to stop the government on their new partnership trade with the US to bring in waste to be recycled in Kenya. What became of this case? What do we, uh, and do we have a chance to win or to stop this? Maybe you can answer those, Liz. Okay. Um, so experts in natural resource management, um, I think at the beginning of, uh, towards the beginning of the presentation, we addressed uh, evidence by experts in court and, uh, what we said uh, then was that uh, experts support uh, your public interest litigation matter in instances, number one, where there is a lot of technical information that the judge who is schooled in law does not understand the technical bits of whatever it is. So it could be uh, water quality issues. So there, perhaps the EIA says that the water water quality uh, should is at this standard, but it's actually um, you know below the the standard required. Uh, what are some of the factors to uh, impact something like that? So you use experts in situations where there is. Um, technical issues that you want to communicate to the court. Now, irrespective of that, it is incredibly important not to lose the court by being too technical. If you're able to allow, if, if your expert is able to communicate in a manner that does not, um, is not too technical or loses the court in the, in the, in the, in the proceedings, then the, the better it is. And a good way to do that is to always find somebody who has no relation with the case and try to explain to them. And if they are unable to get it, then you best believe that you'll have a hard time in court. Uh, that's number one. And then maybe the second thing that's important to emphasize is um, 
that your experts should be actual experts. You're not bringing in experts who, you know, do not have the academic qualification and professional experience, or, or also experts who have, um, who are not esteemed in the society. Maybe uh, they've been accused of instances of plagiarism, or they have been accused of bribery at point, or any other issue that might cause the court not to believe or to trust and depend on the on the evidence that the expert is bringing. Uh, how can NGOs support uh, zoning issues? Uh, I usually do find that a lot of NGOs who uh, put in resources into um, awareness creation uh, is also quite important. And it's also uh, important to note that there's no zoning change that happens without um, you know, a call for input into the change of, of zoning or the change of land use. So in instances where land use is changing from industrial to residential, uh, you will find the law actually demands that um, the county planner or the national planner, depending on where the application has been made, uh, puts up a notice of uh, change of land use. And in these instances, it's important for NGOs to actually have somebody whose job is to periodically check through uh, the websites, the newspapers, and the actual county and national planning offices to find out which, which hearings uh, and applications for change of use are coming in and to participate in that process. Um, government uh, and uh, US trade agreement and signatures. Uh, I'm not sure whether that case was actually a court case. I think it was just uh, an advocacy issue and I'm not quite well placed to answer that question. Uh, perhaps uh, Sheila or Sikhi might have a better answer for you uh, for that. Um, any others? Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. So from uh, Zablon, you have said that the court does not allocate anyone the cost of any case. If this is the case, who takes up the unforeseen cost? And two, one of the international NGO collected a number of signatures. That one you said uh, you are not aware. Um, a CAK we are also not aware, but I'll follow up. Um, and if I get any information, I'll be able to share with you, Zablon. You can share with us your email address or your contact. Um, and Diana Maura says she's currently doing M MA environmental law. She has learned a lot. Uh, thank you for shedding light on Kenya environmental jurisprudence. Uh, very in insightful and informative. And she says she will use uh, this session before the exams as it has answered most of the questions uh, they had in the exams. A kudos and well done. Um, uh, the last one is from Nyaga, I think in relation to a question he had asked about uh, CAK uh, having any cases at the cost. Yes, Nyaga, you can get in touch with us um, on our email address. I'll share it in the chat. Uh, so that you can uh, follow up in any issues that you have at the coastal region. Um, do you have any other question? Uh, let me see the chat. Um, can you comment on the progress of the Amboseli avocado case? Uh, Koech Gilbert asks, um, Kamweti says, hello, Elizabeth. What are some of the tips for good evidence gathering, submissive in court, including imagery, all kinds of pollution, records, etc. And thanks for the great lecture. Okay, um, maybe we can start with uh, tips for good evidence gathering. Um, it's important to that uh, when you come to your advocate or to your legal representative to bring a matter before court, they are trained in law and they will use what you have given them uh, based on how you obtained it. 
So there's a rule of evidence uh, that says, um, you know, illegally acquired evidence is not admissible in court, whether or not it actually proves what you're saying. So, so for instance, if you record someone uh, offering to give a bribe, right? But you record them in a private conversation, so it's not in a public place. You do not let them know that you're recording them. You cannot use such evidence in court because it's illegally, it's been illegally obtained. Why? Because you have infringed on their right to um, right to privacy. So irrespective of how good or how true your evidence is, where it came from is incredibly important. If you accessed government documents that were not put on the website, that you did not write a letter to ask for them and they were not given to you um, through official channels, right? Uh, and you present them as evidence in court, the, and maybe the government entity knows these things to be true, they might challenge that evidence based on the fact that it was illegally acquired. So there's that one tip to make sure to do that you acquire evidence legally. You don't steal it, you don't um, sort of uh, bribe someone to give it to you, uh, and you don't manipulate somebody to to give it to you or, or um, you know, breach the right of privacy. Um, number two, in terms of uh, evidence gathering, it's important to have um, a designated person whose job is to pick, is, is to uh, uh, sort of acquire evidence. Um, and it's possible to get lots of those people around. Uh, just make sure that they follow the rules that are supposed to be followed. Um, and perhaps maybe in terms of adducing evidence in court, the best advice would come from your legal counsel when you go to them and tell them these are the documents that I have, whether they're originals or copies and so on and so forth, they'll be able to guide you in terms of we can use this, we can't use this. But sometimes you'll come to court with uh, minutes of a meeting that you did not attend and say, you see these minutes actually prove that this decision was reached out, but you, you did not attend the meeting. So how, how do you um, support the, the, uh, the, the situation you're in in terms of uh, possessing the actual minutes? So it's important to have sort of all of those things in mind. But uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, your advocate will be able to properly guide you on what types of evidence to uh, acquire and uh, how they can be used um, in court. Um, progress of Kiliavo case, the, the matter um, is coming up for um, hearing and men actually mention uh, at the end of uh, this month. Uh, the case has not actually started because of those things that I talked about at the beginning of preliminary objections, so on and so forth. So we actually haven't gotten to the crux of the matter. Um, in terms of litigating the issues, but all the parties have filed the documents they need to file, the plaintiffs have filed, the defendants have filed, and the interested parties have filed. Uh, it's possible to peruse those files at the registry at um, National Environment Tribunal uh, because they're public records and no more, nobody would uh, uh, stop you from having a look at them. I think you just pay a perusal fee. I think it's now 50 shillings or 100 shillings, something like that. Um, and for same costs of the suit, one of the disadvantages that I talked about in uh, as we were ending the, the, the webinar was the cost of the suit, right? And um, th that's why it's advisable to, to go for all other methods of conflict resolution before reaching litigation because you have to pay your lawyer's fees. You have to pay fees for the person who's going to investigate for you. And if you have given your lawyer that, uh, a lot of law firms have additional um, evidence departments where even if you come to us with a title deed, we will still go to the registry to confirm for ourselves that that title deed is not stolen, okay? Or it's not forged. Um, so a lot of uh, law firms have an evidence department and that is quite separate from um, 
from from legal fees because you're paying for somebody to go and authenticate documents and collect documents and all of that. Um, there is also additional things that come up that uh, might need to be paid for. Sometimes you find that the case has taken too long, or you might find that you need to appeal certain decisions that it, or, or rulings that did not go um, your way. So all of those are additional costs. That is why we're saying that um, synergies between um, conservation organizations is important. And even for us as uh, private citizens, especially where you're finding um, uh, you, you, you have some spare money to support a cause, it's important to do it. For us as a law firm, we uh, provide a 30% discount on all our public interest litigation services to NGOs. So any NGOs who, who come to us for, for public interest litigation, we reduce the cost because we know that, um, and communities as well, because we know that that um, actually happens and it's, and it's expensive. So there are various ways that you can engage with the process in terms of costs. Um, so that's why we are encouraging people to um, pursue additional before, let, let that be the end result as opposed to the first um, result or the, or the or, or result, sorry, not result, the, the first result for uh, solving conflicts in environmental governance. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I think we've uh, responded to all the questions. Uh, yeah, the others are just uh, thanking you for the good presentation and everyone asking for the recording uh, that will be shared to you by, by latest tomorrow. So you'll get it on your emails. And I really take this opportunity to thank you, Elizabeth, for creating time and sparing your two, actually more than two hours uh, to be with us during this webinar. I hope that you will uh, join us again should we I invite you for another one. And, and I thank all the participants uh, that registered. We had like 128 around there. And I really appreciate uh, their time for those who joined. And I hope that you have learned something from this webinar and you're going to use it in your daily, in your day-to-day -day, um, activities. Uh, as I mentioned, as when we were starting, this is one of the many series of webinars that we have around conservation and environment. Uh, so we will be sharing uh, the topic for the next one and when it will be, uh, so that you can also register and join us. Uh, if you have any further questions about this topic, either today's presentation or anything else about uh, public interest litigation, please write to us. Um, at info at conservationalliance.or.ke, info at conservationalliance.or.ke, uh, and we will be able uh, to respond to you through Elizabeth. And if you have any other question, you can also follow us on our socials at Conservation Alliance of Kenya. We will also take your questions and forward them to Elizabeth, or we will answer them if we are able to. And thank you so much. And I wish you all a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much for your attention.